Good morning, good afternoon, people of Earth, and welcome to the SETI Institute Hangout. I'm Frank Marchis. I'm a senior researcher at the Carl Sagan Center of the SETI Institute, and today we'll be hosting and moderating this Hangout from the SETI Institute. So the goal of our Hangout is to share with you, the public, and our SETI fans, the excitement of recent discoveries or works in the field of astrobiology. So before starting this Hangout, and since I have you undivided attention, I remind you that the SETI Institute is a non-profit scientific organization made of 80 scientists. They all work in different areas in the field of astrobiology. You can support our institute and our researchers by visiting our website at SETI.org and joining one of our crowdfunding campaigns uh, listed in the Curiosity Movement. Innovative projects of all kinds uh, can be found in our Curiosity Movement, so if you've, you feel free to participate to our research. So our Hangout today has once again a different format than the previous ones, with researchers located here and elsewhere in the US. So without further ado, let's start by introducing the closest participant to this Hangout nearby me. Hi, Jill. Hello there. This is Jill Tarter that you all know, of course. She's the Bernard Oliver ch uh, Chair for the City Research at the City Institute. Uh, Jill works at the City Institute since its creation, so a quarter of a century, yeah. roughly. <laughs> a little more, actually. And is, uh, she's currently involved in uh, searching for funding for the City Research. That's the hardest <laughs> search of all. <laughs> for the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, located remotely, and uh, you can see that the, on this window here, uh, in south of South California, we have uh, Matt Povich. Hi, Matt. How are you? Hello. So Matt is a professor of astronomy at the Cal Poly Pomona, and I would like to say that thanks to you, this uh, hangout is basically uh, a, a reality. Uh, you stopped by the City Institute a few weeks ago, and we basically have this kind of casual discussion, and you mentioned this project to me, and I thought it was an, ex an exciting and interesting topic for our hangout. So thank you again for sharing with us your, uh, your ideas. My pleasure. So Matt is... Um, He's a professor, as I say. He has been he's, he studied young stellar objects in our galaxy using a variety of space telescopes, um, and he's also the co-author of the search for Kardashev Type One, Type Two, Type Three civilization that we will talk about today. And now we are crossing uh, the American continent to reach uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, and meet Jason Wright. Hi, Jason. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. It's good to see you again. Good to uh, see we, you too. We used to work together a, a long time ago at UC Berkeley. But uh, is. Jason, Jason is now a professor of astronomy at Penn State University. And uh, he's what we call an exoplanetary scientist. Uh, he and his group uh, search for exoplanets, planets around other stars using uh, ground-based telescopes, essentially. And he's also the PI, the principal investigator of this project. And finally, our more distant speaker is Freeman Dyson. Hi, Freeman. How are you? So Freeman is, uh, uh, I shouldn't, I don't know how to introduce you. Everybody knows you. But let me, let me, let me give you a very short bio here. Freeman is a, a theoretical physicist and mathematician at the Institute, of Ad, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He's a prolific author of books and papers on several topics, including quantum electrodynamics, solid-state physics, nuclear engineering, religion, science and religion, and also astronomy. He's the first person who published in 1960 a paper in science that I read, and I, really, I read it with uh, a great pleasure, in fact. It's very well written. This, this paper is called Search for Artificial Stellar Sources of Infrared Radiation where he described the existence of megastructures built by super civilization that we call today the Dyson Sphere. So I remind our viewers that they can ask questions directly on this Google Hangout or through, through Twitter using our hashtag SETI Hangout. Okay, this was the longest introduction I ever gave for a Hangout, so let's, let's start straight to the point with uh, Matt. I'm going to give you... Uh, the, the easy or difficult task to explain to the viewers what are Kardashev Type 2 and Type 3 civilization and what is the WISE telescope. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Frank. So 
<clears throat> the uh, Kardashev scale was proposed by an astronomer named Nick Kardashev back in the 1960s, and it's a way to parameterize the energy consumption of a technological civilization. And the original scale, a Kardashev 1 civilization, was us. It was the uh, energy consumed by human society. Um, that's been tweaked in recent decades uh, to reflect more that the primary source of energy available to us on Earth is the radiation that the sun deposits on the surface of the Earth. And so now, uh, for the purposes of our project, and I think more broadly, a Kardashev 1 is considered to be a civilization that would use essentially the majority of the energy that lands on the Earth from the sun, which would leave the human race as a fairly low decimal Kardashev if you were to split it into gradations. With this newer definition, you can more easily understand what a Kardashev II would represent, and that is a civilization that is able to harness essentially all of the energy put out by its home star. And for us, that would be one solar luminosity. And, uh, that so that would be a Dyson sphere, right? That uh, might be a well, Dyson sphere? That would be a Dyson sphere, uh, would be the mechanism for doing that proposed to harness it, a Dyson sphere or a Dyson swarm, which, I'm, uh, which we will talk more about later, I'm sure. Uh, but this idea that we have some mag mega structure of solar collectors that fill the space in our solar system and are able to grab the energy that the sun puts out. And the consequence of this is that those collectors would grab energy mostly in the optical part of the spectrum where the sun puts out its peak. In so doing, they would become heated up, um, most likely to temperatures that were a few hundred Kelvin, and then they would in turn radiate in the infrared. And so that's why we're talking about looking in the infrared. Uh, before I jump to discussing the tools, I mentioned that a Kardashev 3 then would be a civilization that has made a, a similarly gigantic leap in energy consumption. So from a Kardashev 1 to 2, you're talking about a factor of roughly 10 billion. And uh, then if you consider that there are roughly 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, if you could harness the energy from most of them, you're doing another jump of 10 to 100 billion in energy usage from a 2 to a Kardashev 3. And uh, you know, one way of doing this would simply be to build Dyson spheres around the majority of stars in the galaxy. So that would make the galaxy not visible in not Detectable, invisible, but detectable in the in the near mid infrared. Then, indeed, and that, if that happened, you, if the extreme case where stars are completely enshrouded throughout the galaxies, then you would have a dark galaxy in visible light, and you would see it only in the infrared. Uh, so now, let me attempt to put a picture of the telescope we are using primarily for this search. Uh, can everybody see this one? Yes. Yeah, came yeah. through. So this is a cartoon of the WISE telescope, as Jason pointed out. We do not have good photographs of it in space. And uh, the background of this is a representation of our own Milky Way seen at infrared wavelengths. So we are essentially seeing the uh, plane of our galaxy. We live in a disk galaxy, and so we see it as a narrow strip across the sky. And all of that dust actually glows, so you can see the Milky Way glowing. Now, this is not Dyson spheres glowing in the Milky Way. This is interstellar dust that fills space and is heated up by starlight. And the WISE telescope is uh, very well suited to detect it. And more importantly, WISE has observed the entire sky. And it has done so at infrared wavelengths of 3.5 micron, 4.6 micron, 12 microns, and 22 microns. Now, if you're looking at a galaxy, not the Milky Way now, but our nearest neighbor, the famous Andromeda galaxy, or M31, if you look at it at visible wavelengths, like what our eyes see, it looks like this. You can see at the center a yellowish bulge with older stars, and then you have the star-forming spiral arms that are alternately blue from the hot, bright, young stars that are forming there. But you also see these dark dust clouds striating through it. If you then switch this to infrared wavelengths, it looks a bit different. So all of these dust clouds are now lit up and glowing brightly, and they're colored red here in this image. And then the bulge shrinks and looks a bit smaller, but you can still see those stars. They now appear blue in our infrared image. 
It so does mean that the galaxy here is full of dust, mm -hmm. but there is two yeah. tiny galaxies up, um, the up, up and down, which yes. are in fact blue, so they have much less dust than, than this one. Yes, that's right. So these galaxies here, you can see that it's kind of funny. The galaxies, the up and down, they appear yellowish in the visible light image, and they look more like the central bulge of the Andromeda galaxy. And then when you switch to the infrared colorized image, they turn these things all turn blue. So a normal star-forming galaxy is a mixture in the infrared of things that appear blue and things that appear red. And uh, Jason will speak more to how we are using our tools to separate these things out, these uh, natural sources of bright infrared emission. And uh, there are many in the universe. So how do we go about looking for potentially artificial sources of infrared emission? So let's, I think I'll stop there. Perfect transi transition. Jason, is your turn. So Jason, you're the, PI, the principal investigator of this project. So. Could you yeah. tell us a little bit how the idea came out first and uh, then describe the project itself? <laughs> sure. The, the idea actually started back when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley. And my advisor, Jeff Marcy, suggested that we um, go looking for Dyson spheres uh, in the infrared. And I think he suggested that we look in K-band in, in, in the two-mass survey. And after fiddling around a little while, you know, we, we quickly realized that um, this survey of the sky from the ground didn't look in long enough wavelengths. It's near infrared wavelengths. And so um, if there were alien civilizations with very large energy supplies giving off all of this waste heat, they wouldn't necessarily show up in that survey. But it, it planted the, the germ of the idea in my head that if there were ever a all sky survey uh, at mid infrared wavelengths, it would be uh, sensitive to this sort of thing. Um, and of course, there was such a survey, the, the uh, infrared astronomy satellite IRAS. Uh, which launched in the 80s, did an all-sky survey of mid-infrared wavelengths. And uh, it did so with what, by today's standards, is pretty low sensitivity and pretty low resolution. Um, but still, it was the first such all-sky survey with enough sensitivity to potentially uh, fulfill Dr. Dyson's um, suggestion from his 1960 paper that we go looking for the waste heat of alien civilizations uh, with infrared astronomical equipment. Um, and that was actually done. There's a, uh, uh, an astronomer, I think, at Fermilab, named Richard Kerrigan, who used the IRAS database and went through looking for objects that seemed to be too red, that would have the characteristics of um, a lot of mid-infrared emission. Uh, so IRAS, sorry to interrupt, but IRAS is this, um, another a space telescope which was launched in the in mid 80s. That's right. And, um, and so he was using this survey done by the IRAS satellite to, um, uh, to look for these things. And so um, the, the, the challenge is that there are many things that give off a lot of the infrared light, which is in fact why they launched IRAS, to go find those things. Uh, and I'll talk in a bit about how he used IRAS to try to distinguish naturally uh, bright infrared sources uh, from things that might be representative of alien civilizations. In 2009, the WISE satellite was launched, which essentially performed a very similar survey to IRAS. Uh, it didn't go quite as long wavelength, but it has much better resolution, so it can tell much better what it's looking at, uh, and it has much better sensitivity. And so it would be able to detect uh, something with the luminosity of the sun that's surrounded by collectors giving off all of that energy in a bit infrared across a great distance, across most of the galaxy, actually. And so when uh, we actually had a talk here at Penn State by someone who was uh, using the WISE satellite to look for brown dwarfs, and he mentioned that they had effective temperatures of around 300 Kelvin, and that's when this comment by Jeff Marcy came back to my brain, that WISE would be a really good way to go looking for Dyson spheres. Uh, and so that's what we're doing with it. We're looking for these large energy supplies with WISE. So the, um, the three phases of the project are that first, uh, we're going to look for uh, extended objects. That is, not things that look like stars, but things that are clearly galaxies. Um, and we can, uh, we can tell that they vanish as point sources. They're, they're big extended objects in WISE, because it has pretty good resolution, six arc seconds. 
And we're going to look for the galaxies that have too much mid-infrared emission. It turns out that uh, even the, the most active star-forming galaxies uh, tend to only give off so much mid-infrared radiation from dust is kind of a limit. And so we're looking for, at first, galaxies that have more infrared emission than you would naturally find, just the extreme outliers. And the nice thing there is no matter what they are, they're very interesting. And so we'll have useful scientific results no matter what it is that we find. Um, and we so will those also are galaxies, Jason, those are galaxies that sit off in the, the far reaches of a color-color diagram, right? So that that's right. they don't look like the other normal uh, galaxies that you have in the field. That's right. And so we can, we can look at their typical ratios of the, the mid-infrared to near-infrared colors. So, um, and I've got some, uh, some, some figures here, I suppose. I can, uh, I can pop one up here, I think. Uh, let me see if I can pick this up. So this should show a... Is that showing up? Yes. No, for um, us it's black. Oh, no, yeah. here it comes. There it is. Okay. Ah. So this is... We can have a scientific discussion without showing a spectra, of course. Yeah, I know, <laughs> a I know. Spectrum. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a spectral energy distribution, uh, or a spectrum, of what uh, the black line uh, shows what an elliptical galaxy would look like. So these are the blue, the, the, the blue small galaxies on M31 that Matt showed. And the four vertical bands are the wavelengths at which the WISE satellite uh, makes measurements. And so um, what you're seeing on the left-hand side at wavelengths of around one micron are, is starlight. And this galaxy template, the black line, has very little or no dust, almost no dust. Uh, and so there's a lot less uh, energy out at 10 microns in the third band than there is in the second uh, band at around 4.5 microns. And so that ratio of the amount of flux you see at, at 4.5 microns to 12 microns tells you something about how much dust is in the galaxy. And so what this plot is attempting to show is that if even 1% of a galaxy's light were coming out at 300 Kelvin, so a temperature may be typical of a Dyson sphere, um, that there would be a noticeable increase in the flux that you would expect at 12 microns compared to the flux you get at 4.5. And so that's an example of the sort of thing we're looking for. We're looking for very we're looking for excess flux in that third band, W3, compared to the second band, um, W2. And the nice thing about looking for galaxies is, uh, looking in galaxies, is that, um, I just got this off here. They, uh, there's a lot of things that could be read, but most of them are not extended objects like galaxies. So there are ways that a star could have a lot of mid-infrared emission uh, that might be hard to tell, but if you can tell that it's extended, you know that it's a galaxy, as long as you're out of the galactic plane. And so um, you can, that really reduces the number of false positives that you might encounter. So we're going to look for the extreme outliers. Uh, the second phase of our project, which maybe we'll talk about a little more later, will be to look for type 2 Kardashev civilizations, point sources that appear to be too red. And then the third phase will be to follow these things up and say, okay, we found these things, they have too much mid-infrared emission, what are they? Are they known classes of astrophysical object, and they're just extraordinary? Are they new classes of astrophysical object that we didn't know were out there? Um, and if so, can we follow them up and determine if maybe that mid-infrared emission is actually coming from extraterrestrial civilization? So but, what kind of follow-up do you have in mind? Well, I hope he's going to send us the, the finding list. <laughs> That's right. right. Well, <laughs> so we can look yes. with the Allen Telescope Array. Absolutely. The Allen Telescope Array will be a key follow-up uh, instrument because um, looking for alien civilizations uh, this way uh, is really a process of elimination. You, you don't know what you don't know can be created naturally. You don't know what's out there in this new parameter space that WISE has opened up for us. And so um, you have to first eliminate all of the known sources, the possibilities that it could be for natural objects, because you have to have the presumption that it's natural at first. And then if it's, if it's nothing that you know about, then you have to start getting creative and say, what else could it be? Um, and uh, you're hoping to get to the end of the line, the, the last resort explanation. But if you could detect something that was manifestly the result of intelligent life, something so extraordinary that it couldn't be natural, an alien signal with a message encoded in it, then you get to jump to the end of your logical reasoning. 
you say, you're, you're done. You don't have to rule other things out because they just announce themselves. And so, um, yes, yeah, so we would definitely like to shortcut uh, and skip all of that long exclusion process and just get, get a, a detection from an alien civilization. Thank you, Jason. You look excited. You look totally excited about this. No, I get excited when I talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Freeman. Um, as I already said, you the first person who published this idea of um, this mega structure that an advanced civilization will build to uh, harvest energy from its star and maybe from its galaxy. Um, could you tell us a little bit of you, what you think about this project and? Um, Kind of uh, bring a little bit of perspective over time. That would be useful. Yeah, well, I, I'm happy that somebody's looking at the sky, and and there's always interesting stuff to be seen. I mean, the first rule of any such project is it should be interesting, even if you don't find any aliens. So that's uh, so. No matter whether or not you are successful in 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 in, in, in that particular enterprise, you you're doing good astronomy. And I think that that should be the case here. It, and I'm very disappointed that instruments only take four, four color photometry. That's, of course, not enough to do a diagnosis. So you really want to have a complete spectrum if you want to see what's going on. So this is a very crude instrument. It's a uh, I mean, I, I remember vividly when we, the IRS went up, the IRS uh, infrared astronomy satellite went up. We expected to see a few of these infrared sources. What we actually saw was the sky is crawling with them. There are millions of these objects in the sky, which we had not expected, which makes it, of course, much less likely that you'll find one that uh, has unusual characteristics. So. It, we were just drowned in, in, in information from the IRAS survey. And so the, the, the same, of course, is true now, even more so. There's uh, just too many sources to look at each of them carefully. And I think the most important thing to look for is rapid variations. And that's something this instrument doesn't, uh, is, is not adapted for doing. We should be looking, if you really want to discriminate something artificial from something natural, you want to look at very fast variations of, of the order of seconds or minutes. And, and, uh, and that's, of course, requires a different kind of instrument. We did a project here in Princeton, which was called Optical SETI, looking for nanosecond optical pulses, which, of course, would be extremely interesting if you, if you found them, because there's nothing natural that only takes a nanosecond. So if you see something in the sky that flashes with a nanosecond time scale, you know it has to be artificial. And, and so we looked for some of those in, in collaboration with Harvard. We didn't find any, not surprisingly. But I mean that would have been a, a clear di diagnosis to tell whether it's artificial or not. And so you'd, you'd like to go to this kind of a ra rapid time scale if you really want, if you're serious about finding things that are artificial. So I hope that you'll do that. And but of course, what you're doing at the moment is just eliminating large classes of objects so you don't need to search for them and search, search them with other methods. And so this is only the first stage in a program, not, not you're not going to bring it to an end with that instrument. So you you said it will it will be useful to do a large uh, a fast photometric study basically. But are you talking about pho fast photometric stu study as well in the mid infrared? Well, that's what you're doing, but but uh, it's certainly not enough. You can't. There's no way with four colors that you can diagnose something as being artificial or natural. Yeah, but there will be uh, there is various instrument available now with uh, mid infrared spectrograph like um, Sophia, for instance, is a, the stratospheric plane that could be used to uh, to follow up. But my right. question is, what is the what will be the origin of this variation? Well, we don't know except that it's uh, if it has a, 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 a time scale of of, of of seconds, then it's probably not natural. 
it's hard to imagine natural objects going that fast, although sometimes they do, of course. I mean, there are things like pulsars, which have millisecond time scales. But anyway, it, 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 it gives you then a, a much more detailed picture of what's going on. But Freeman, we began optical SETI when we finally had the, um, the diodes with nanosecond rise times that could do the job that we could afford. And right. it's just now becoming possible um, to start using the instrumentation, similar instrumentation for the infrared, the near infrared. Good. Uh, and yeah. we, you know, people are looking at getting that kind of technology on telescopes to do the search because it extends your distance. You don't have the uh, scattering and obscuration by the dust that you do in the optical. Well, good. I'm very happy to hear that. And so who is doing that? Um, it's being proposed at a couple of places. Um, but Shelley Wright, who did the optical SETI detector at Lick, is proposing, has now proposed a couple of times for an instrument uh, from, she's in Toronto in Canada now. And, and Frank Drake here. Um, is looking into what could be done. Right. It's, it's one of these things we've got to find the funding to do it. Yeah, well, it's not, it, it, of course, uh, uh, the, the beauty of this nanosecond pulse search was it was extremely cheap. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 was, it was paid for out of the Princeton education budget. It didn't even need research money. And, Okay, but my question that I had for you was exactly this, so you already answered to my question. Well, it was basically yeah. the follow-up with SETI. Right, so you want to get the optical uh, devices that we now have, you want to get them on bigger glass, right? You want to see if we can use them with these large solar heliostat collectors, energy collectors, use them at night uh, to do SETI searches, that's been suggested. Um, figure out a way to get them on um, the... We, we don't need good quality, we just need light buckets. So mm -hmm. the... That's a Colossus project, for instance? Yeah, the Colossus project actually is, is one that the folks in Hawaii are talking about. Um, I actually think there's an intermediate step. We can put them on some of these um, uh, cosmic gray detectors, um, the, the Whipple kind of telescopes that are... I'm blanking on the name of the array. The Veritas? Um, yes, thanks, Veritas. Uh, and then extend it into the infrared. And, you know, I'd, Freeman, what kind of, if you're thinking about, if you can't do the time variation um, because the spacecraft are just not being, because as you said, it would be an engineered, not natural process, and the space agencies are more, interested in building instrumentation that will see natural processes. So if you're excluded from the time variation, how would you have modified WISE? Um, you know, would one more band be okay? Will you need ten more bands to do the discrimination? No, I mean, that, that's not the, certainly not going to be enough. The, the, this broadband photometry just isn't good enough. I Jeff, agree. I think you have a slide or something about this, no? Yes, I, I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with Freeman that um, uh, the broadband photometry, uh, our purpose with WISE is uh, to exactly address this, this problem um, that Freeman pointed out, is that there's just too many infrared sources, and we need to whittle that down to reasonable candidates. And so the effect of having all of those infrared sources is that we will only be able to... Um, uh, uh, they basically contaminate the sample. Um, so there's a few ways that we can distinguish um, things and use WISE to, to, to throw out the things that are most likely natural, that you know, well understood classes, and to uh, pick out a sample for follow-up, and then there's follow-up that we can do to further whittle that down to a small number of promising sources that we can apply other techniques for to try and find these unambiguous signals, like nanosecond pulses would be exactly the sort of thing um, that would be an unambiguous detection. Um, you would love to do that across the entire sky, but it must be easier to do it on a single source. So we're trying to provide that target list from WISE. So um, the, the difficulty, and I've got a slide to show why you can't just look at anything that has been infrared emission and say, look, we, we found it. Um, this is a, uh, another SCD, another spectrum, uh, showing 
the, the green line is a spiral galaxy, and it's what you expect to see. And what you see is that out at 10 microns and 8 microns, there are, is a lot of extra flux above what you would see from an old elliptical galaxy. And that comes from dust, from polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are being illuminated by stars, and they radiate this characteristic emission right where we expect to see waste heat um, from alien civilizations. So in this case, um, there would be two ways, and this is the problem that, that Freeman was pointing out with broadband photometry. You could equivalently interpret the fluxes that WISE sees from these two galaxies. Uh, uh, in the green, a spiral galaxy, and in the blue, it's an old elliptical galaxy, but 10% of the starlight is being reprocessed down to 300 Kelvin, just as, a, just as a toy example to illustrate the problem. And in both cases, you get roughly the same amount of flux in all four bands. So the starlight gives you the same amount of, uh, of flux at the two short bands, at 3.5 and 4.5. And, 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 and then the, um, the, the waste heat at 300 Kelvin gives you the, the 12 and 22 micron emission, whereas in the spiral it comes from the dust. But either way, you get about the same amount. So spirals have similar SEDs to what you would expect from a large civilization using 10% of the starlight of the galaxy. So the population of spirals means you can't use broadband photometry to look for things less than about 10% of uh, the starlight being reprocessed by Dyson spheres. So you could say, all right, well, maybe we want to find something that's more like 35%. Um, so here's an example of uh, two more. Uh, the green here is a famous starburst or ultra-luminous infrared galaxy called ARP220, sort of the extreme case of an infrared bright galaxy. Uh, and in this case, I have to crank up the amount of starlight being reprocessed by a hypothetical alien civilization to up towards 90% before I can get something that's clearly giving off too much mid-infrared radiation compared to that. So what this means is that Beyond about 70 or 80 percent of the starlight being reprocessed, we will be pretty sensitive to that. There aren't any natural sources that uh, galaxies that are galaxies that give off so much 12 micron emission compared to their 4 micron emission um, that they could be that they could compete with something using 80, 90, or 100 percent of the starlight. So, in the limit where you surround every star in a galaxy with Dyson spheres. You have almost no optical emission. It's all mid-infrared emission. And there are very few uh, extended galaxies in the sky. There are none, basically. So, um, Jason, yeah. I have a very uh, ignorant question, because yes. I'm, not, uh, I'm not a specialist of galaxy. But how do you know that ARP220 is yeah. not a galaxy which has been har harvested by a, a super ah. civilization? So if you look at it, you can see the dust. This is a nearby galaxy. It's pretty well resolved. It's, it's fantastically well studied. Um, Matt is probably a better person to, to answer the details there. Um, the, um, and I don't know to what degree mid-infrared spectra have been taken of it. I, I, I would expect it would be a prime target. So this brings me to things we can do now without nanosecond pulses or um, obviously alien radio signals to try and further call out natural sources. So here, I've gone back to my example of a spiral versus something with only 10% of its starlight being reprocessed. And I've labeled three distinct ways that the two spectra will differ. So we can use spectrographs that work in the mid-infrared. That's this yellow uh, box here. You can see my cursor, I hope. And those are ground-based spectrographs you're going to talk about now? Um, so I was actually just talking to Franck about this, exactly what one could use to do this. So the point is that in the detail, the spectra are very different. And WISE, which only adds up all of the flux in those purple stri stripes, can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. But if you have a spectrum, then you can look for these characteristic wiggles and bumps in the spectrum that are characteristic of PAHs, these, this dust. And so this is exactly... To, just to explain this to the, to the viewers, yeah. the... WISE as a broad filter, so is basically WISE will not be capable of differentiating, de identifying those tiny ringers, which are in fact due it just to absorption. adds up all of the light of these little ones here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, what you propose to have is to have a, a follow-up with a spectrum, a spectrograph, which will be basically taking a spectrum of this area to identify this or maybe see the black body curve directly. 
That's right. And this is exactly what Richard Kerrigan did in IRAS. IRAS had a low-resolution spectrograph, and he was looking for these characteristic bumps in the reddest objects that IRAS found. And that's how he was ruling out objects and saying, no, this isn't bright because it has aliens, it's bright because it has a lot of dust, and I know that because I can see these characteristic dust features, so I know it's dust. So uh, we were just talking, uh, emailing Frank and I, about which, um, which instruments might be used to do this, and it's a bit frustrating that there aren't very many mid-infrared spectrographs that we uh, would be able to get time on, although perhaps Canary Cam uh, on GTC would be a good option, or some of the spectrographs on uh, SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory, NASA's uh, uh, mid-infrared telescope on a plane. Or so JWST. Or JWST would be would be excellent. Um, if we can get a really good candidate, JWST getting a spectrum here would help a lot. And so JWST. I just want to point out the other two obvious ways to go about it. One is if there's if there's dust, there has to be molecules, and if there are molecules, there should probably be carbon monoxide. And so we can um, use radio telescopes to go looking for the characteristics of molecules like carbon monoxide. Um, and that is pretty far outside where I work in terms of uh, what sorts of photons I typically study. Uh, but maybe uh, Jill can help me out with exactly what we would look for and, and whether we can do that at the same time that we're looking for um, other signals. Well, I, I actually yeah. wonder whether that's exclusionary because you would expect a technological civilization or lots of them to exist in a galaxy where there are metals and um, molecules that were the precursors of life. Um, so I'm not sure why you would be willing to say if you see CO or other molecules in the radio that there couldn't be technological civilizations. I don't. So I don't my question would be whether um, the given the amount of dust that would be required to generate the amount of mid-infrared emission we see, can we make reasonable predictions about how much CO there has to be to support that much dust? Right, and so the classic the radio dust to CO ratio. Yeah. A thousand times less dust than there should be. That would suddenly turn a candidate from, you know, kind of interesting to extremely interesting, by the way. I understand, okay. And then um, the final way, which might be more of a pipe dream, um, is that there the dust radiates thermally. It gives off its own waste heat, but it tends to do it out here in the far infrared at 100 or 200 or 300 microns. And um, you, again, if, if you have PAHs, you have to have that far infrared thermal emission. If you uh, have uh, waste heat from alien civilizations, you probably won't. We can talk about why I think that's the case, but I, I think you will have a factor of about 100 or so in this particular case between the expectation for a natural source of dust and, uh, and alien civilizations. Um, unfortunately, I don't know of any way to go get very sensitive measurements out at 100 or 200 microns, and I don't have any plans to it's, do that. We've been looking into how sensitive the rock was, but it's difficult. Um, Except but if observe this area of the sky. What's that? Herschel, Herschel telescope. Herschel did, service. but Herschel was a uh, very narrow um, very narrow beam. It wasn't an all-sky survey. So if we had an all-sky survey at 100 microns, then the far infrared to mid infrared flux ratio should um, be there should be a ratio that's quite characteristic of dust. And if the mid infrared greatly exceeded the far infrared uh, around a particular object, that would make it an extremely good candidate for follow-up. So those are my three ideas for how to further call the candidates we generate with this survey down to something manageable for follow-up with the ATA and other, other telescopes. I'd like to point out that in, in some sense we've been unfortunate historically with the order that the most recent wave of infrared satellite observatories were deployed. Uh, Spitzer, the Space Telescope, had a very sensitive mid-infrared spectrograph called the Infrared Spectrograph, or IRS, which means something different to most people. <laughs> but, uh, it, it's, it, it is no longer operating uh, for a similar reason to why the Herschel Space Observatory, which would be great at following up the 100 micron emission, is no longer operating. These require cryogenic cooling, and it's very difficult to maintain that for more than two to five years in orbit. So those cryogens run out. And if WISE had predated Spitzer and Herschel by even you know three or four years, 
if we had done this all sky survey with Wise and identified our candidates, we would then want to follow them up with Herschel and Spitzer IRS. And we simply can't do that, not because of any technological limitation, but because these were ephemeral observatories that, that have the, finished their missions and are not planned with specific replacements. Well, you could ask the Japanese. They have a, they have a project of a mid-infrared telescope. I forgot the name of it. Someone remember the name? But An orbital. Oh, yeah. Orbital. And they're supposed to launch it in like two years, I think. It's going to be... Um, a, a, a potential good a potentially good instrument for a follow-up. So this will be far infrared or mid infrared? I think it's mid infrared. Okay. Because the the main target is in fact to use a coronagraph to uh, search for exoplanets as well. So okay. and it's mid infrared. Mm. Uh, another interesting irony when we're talking about those bumps and wiggles that Jason highlighted in the middle of his spectrum. The PAH actually stands for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. So these, these features that help confound our interpretations of the colors of Ys and make it difficult for us to unambiguously identify you know, these SETI candidates are organic molecules. You know, they, these, are, these are carbon rings. You know, these, are, these are very complicated things that, that um, you know, in, in some ways could, could be ingredients in the soup of life. Now, they're, they're living in space in between stars, so they're not, they're not sitting in a pond of scum waiting to be you know, waiting to have bacteria form in them, but we, we are actually seeing organics everywhere in the universe. And so we're losing everybody here, most likely. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we just mentioned, you are just mentioning that the ringer we see are in fact organic molecules as well. Yes, but they're not indicative of life. In fact, they're responsible for, as Freeman pointed out, this plethora of very bright infrared sources that are masking potential waste heat from, from any of civilizations that might be out there. Okay, I have a question for Jason and Matt. And um, what's your strategy for the publication, and for what's the timeline you have for this project? Well, um, we are finishing up a paper we have on the justification for the search and the strategy that we're uh, undertaking here. Uh, the second paper will be our um, our results for our extended source search. So we've, we've tried to identify all of the things in WISE that are galaxies, and uh, we're going to publish what the most extreme galaxies are in terms of their mid-infrared uh, fluxes compared to near-infrared. So um, this will be interesting in its own on a scientific basis, just what are the reddest galaxies. And some of them are new to science. There's, no one's ever published a paper even mentioning these objects that were basically discovered to be interesting by WISE, and we'll be the first ones to talk about them. And then um, we will move on to point sources, meaning that we are looking uh, at galaxies that, wa that WISE can't tell are galaxies. They're too far away. They're just like the points. And classical Dyson spheres in our own galaxy, stars that have too much um, mid-infrared radiation. And um, there we're going to have to use the fact that we know where there's a lot of dust in the galaxy, where we should expect stars to have a lot of mid-infrared radiation, and use that spatial distribution on the sky to say, what's that star over there? It's not in a dust cloud. It's not in a star-forming region. It doesn't look like it should be young. Why does it have so much mid-infrared emission? We come up with a good candidate list that way. Um, and uh, one possibility that was actually pointed out to me by Adam Krauss as a good way to distinguish very distant galaxies that are just too small to resolve from uh, things in our galaxy. And even beyond that, giant stars in our galaxy, called AGB stars, which are typically dusty and can be very mid-infrared bright, from um, stars like the sun that don't, aren't quite as bright, uh, that are anomalously red, is just by how far away they are. So if we could get a distance measurement for all these things, that would help us sort all of these sources into extragalactic giant stars that should be dusty and anomalously dusty um, ordinary stars. And the Gaia mission, which is to launch uh, very very shortly. November uh, 3rd. Yeah, we'll, we'll measure distances to most of the sources we'll be detecting in the galaxy. And so if we find something that's anomalously infrared bright and one solar luminosity, just as bright as the sun, but giving off 90% of its emission as at 12 and 24 microns, 
and it's not young, and it's not in a star-forming region, that would be anomalous. And that by itself, I think, would put it right to the top of our candidate list to go uh, looking at. No, what I find exciting is that you're looking for the type 3, which we didn't do before, that uh, we had thought always about individual stars with dust around them, and now you're putting much more attention on, onto the extended sources, which are galaxies, and you, with the extended sources you can do much better, so I'm very happy about that. Um, Jason, you you have not yet mentioned how you believe potentially that it would be unusual to find only a few Kardashev twos in a galaxy, and that Kardashev two should relatively quickly, in uh, astronomical terms, become Kardashev three. Yeah, um, this is um, Michael Hart's argument from uh, uh, a paper he wrote in 1975, a, a far too pessimistic paper about about SETI prospects, but his reasoning was that um, it does not take long to cross the galaxy. Um, that the, 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 the time scales involved to populate the entire galaxy are short compared to the ages of galaxies. And so if you can travel between the stars, if you can build interstellar probes, and that might sound crazy, but we now have one. <laughs> I mean, Voyager 1 just left the solar Officially, system. Officially, yes. Officially, last again. year, finally <laughs> again, left the solar system. Um, and so building a probe that can go to another star is within our grasp. Give us a million years, and I'm sure we can build something at least a little faster. <laughs> I know, Jill, you've been thinking about this a lot. Well, <laughs> actually, tonight I go to a meeting in Houston, a symposium on the 100-year starship. Uh, right. Study, right. What could right. we do? So no matter how optimistic you are or pessimistic you are, you have to admit we're going to be able to do this on a time scale very, very short compared to the age of the galaxy. And the thing is, once you get to a nearby star, the stars themselves are moving apart. They, they aren't static. And so people make these maps of the galaxy as if they're like neighborhoods in a city. And it's hard to get from one neighborhood to another because it's far away. But in fact, the galaxy is stirring itself up, and the stars have a lot of peculiar motions. So we make trips in and out and back and forth around the galaxy. It's not a circular orbit we're on. The, other Our rotation, are the period of rotation is 80 million years, something like this? Yeah, something 80 or 100 million years. Um, but, you know, that star right next to us going the other way is taking a different track. And so if you put a colony on that other star, it's not like those two stars are going to be near each other going around. They're going to go in totally different directions and explore different parts of the galaxy. And if you put a colony on every star as it passes every 10,000 years, you'll fill the galaxy in uh, something like 100 million years or a billion years. Which is um, nothing in the time. <laughs> which is nothing in cosmic time. So the argument is that if you're spacefaring and capable of building colonies, that you should fill a galaxy very quickly. And so um, the time scale from going just a little patch of a galaxy that has Dyson spheres in it to the whole galaxy filled with them uh, is short on cosmic time. And so it would be unlikely to catch a galaxy in the act of this spreading. It'd be, it, um, you'd be surprised if they'd only filled half the galaxy or something like that, because that's a relatively brief phase of galactic colonization. So let me ask you a question. Um, there's two interpretations, I think, of the Kardashev threes. Um, one, the, the sort of thing I think you were just talking about, where all the stars are twos, right? And the, then by definition, you're manipulating um, the better part of the energy of the galaxy. Um, but what about the other interpretation, where there's one or a few that actually somehow, by doing something else, can modify the entire output of um, their galaxy. Those I remember having a conversation with Nick Kardashev who was saying those guys are gone. Once they've managed to have the ability to manipulate so much energy, they're going to find a way to get into another dimension, basically. Right. That they'll sort of just transcend this reality or something. Right. And just not be around anymore. So. I think um, I think it was Carl Sagan I saw use the phrase um, "go beyond the communications horizon." I don't know who's responsible for that phrase, but that that you know we just won't be able to communicate with them because they're off doing something else. Um, I guess my response—I mean, that's certainly possible—but my response to that 
um, is that uh, you don't expect these super civilizations to be monocultural because light travel time is long. And so even if that's possible, you don't expect the entire super civilization across a galaxy to develop that all at once. You don't expect all of them to decide to head off to the other galaxy. And so I, I, I worry about ascribing a single motive to a civilization that spans hundreds of billions of stars. And um, I just I guess I imagine that there would be enough Luddites that they would be content to, you know, build their Dyson spheres while the rest of the civilization headed out. I just wonder if there might be some observational difference between those two kinds of type threes. I guess I don't um, I guess I don't know exactly what it would mean in the second type three. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what that means to harness the energy of the galaxy without absorbing all the starlight in the galaxy. Well, how about if we see some of these relativistic jets from galaxies suddenly flashing in in binary? So in that case, I think the starlight is still available. It's not being intercepted. They're doing something else to generate that excess energy. Maybe the yeah, they're using the black, hole. black yeah. hole. Okay. So the nice thing about a waste heat search is that we don't actually care where they're getting their energy. It doesn't have to be from the starlight because we're not actually comparing the mid-infrared output to the starlight. We're just trying to measure the total luminosity of the mid-infrared light. So if they've tapped zero point energy and they're using their Romulan warp drives and they don't need starlight, then you know the sky's the limit on their energy supply. They might have several galactic luminosities to work with. That actually makes them much easier to detect because they'll be so fantastically bright in the mid-infrared. So because we're just looking for how much mid-infrared luminosity is coming off of these things, and we're scaling that against the starlight, but we don't really see the starlight go down when they absorb it. That's a linear effect. Um, then they can use their central black hole, they can use their zero-point energy, whatever it is, they'll still show up as having too much waste heat. And so that's sort of the, the so genius you, of this Dysonian uh, approach, is you're just looking for the waste heat. Yeah, to be short on time. Just okay. to rem so basically you are, with this kind of search, you are searching for the heat waste of these civilizations, okay, right. this super civilization. That will bring me to my last question, because we have to wrap up very soon, which is, it's even possible that you, detect, you are going to detect civilization that, that does not exist anymore. A civilization that does not exist, a civilization which had built, built this uh, Dyson sphere a long time ago and somehow disappeared, but the, the mega structure is still there and you can still see the, the signal coming from it. So you're doing archeolo astronomy archaeology in this case. You know, there will, be, there will be no way for you to differentiate from an active or inactive civilization. Oh, well, if you I, I ask, would... I do very much like the phrase interstellar archaeology because um, uh, that is we are looking for artifacts and I, I, and I do like that. Um, if you're talking about a single star, I would hope that we could detect these nanosecond pulses or radio signals that would confirm it because if, if it's quiet, then it'll be very hard to know that that's exactly what we're looking at. And that's certainly possible that they would be dead. I would not expect a galaxy spanning civilization to go extinct. So it's, that it's that possible that maybe we are observing already those artifacts, but we don't realize that. Meaning well, I, that I'm hoping that there's the mystery we have in galaxies. When you observe it. galaxies, maybe due to the fact that there was in this galaxy, there were in this galaxy some some super civilization. I'm well, sorry. The whole <laughs> premise of our project is that these are sitting in our data, and so, in to some sense, we have observed them, but we haven't recognized them. Right. Exactly. Right. So we all have to put, you know, develop our Jocelyn Bell genes, right, for, right. for looking through the data and looking at the anomalies. So Freeman, I don't know about you, but I'm really excited. I, I'm disappointed that 50 years plus on, we don't have the correct instrument to look for the kinds of things that you suggested. We don't have the full spectrum uh, capabilities. We don't have the ability to look um, in, from spacecraft with the short time variations. So that's the point. It's taken so long. We had the Kepler mission, which did exactly that. 
but on the short, not on the shortest time scales. Kepler's time variation was limited to 30 minutes or fast cadence to a minute. It was a huge step forward. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm excited by the fact that the folks that are talking to us about this are a whole lot younger than we are. And so the next generation is picking up this challenge, and I think it's terrific. Freeman, you mentioned um, uh, Kepler. Are you are you referring to Lucien Walkowicz's work? I don't know what it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, uh, there's uh, Lucien Walkowicz and uh, Jeff Marcy are both uh, looking through the Kepler data for evidence of alien civilizations. Jeff, in particular, is looking for the Dyson swarms or the megastructures to transit the stars, things that don't look anything like planets going in front. Uh, and, and Lucien is doing something, I think, more non-parametric, just anything extremely out of the ordinary. Good, uh, yes, that's exactly what I like to do, the people to do. It is, the whole point is not just to look for aliens, but to look for anything that's interesting. Because it's by looking this an explains phenomenon that we basically we understand. Yeah, that's, that's where you find important discoveries. Okay. Well, that would be the nice, that's a good way to finish this hangout, which lasted one hour. <laughs> I would like to thank you again, all of you, for your time, for attending, and for this uh, fascinating discussion. Thanks a lot. And uh, for our viewers, I just would like to remind you that this Hangout is part of the Communicate campaign, campaign that we initiated at the SETI Institute, uh, where we want to, we basically want to showcase the best work in astrobiology in planetary, explo uh, planetary exploration. So I encourage you to join us to participate in this discussion by uh, being a member of the Team SETI or by simply uh, liking our Facebook, YouTube, uh, YouTube, Google+, Twitter, pages, our social media, uh, we, you will hear about what we do here at the Institute and what other people have been doing in the field of astrobi astrobiology. Thanks, ag thanks again to everybody and um, see you next week for a uh, hangout on interstellar uh, travel. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Freeman. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.